worthy to be praised. So we gonna lift them up today. Uh, like it's the last time. It may very well be. I don't know. Amen. I don't know. Good morning, y'all. Uh, only about two times a year I like to sing this song. I don't know what you come to do. 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 I come to clap my hands. My hands. I come to stomp my feet. My feet. I come to wave my hands. My hands. I come to say amen. Amen. I don't know what you come to do. 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 I come to kneel and pray. In prayer, I come to praise his name. His name. I come to say amen. Amen. I come to say amen. Amen. I don't know what you come to do. 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 Clap. My hand, my head, on my feet, my feet, say amen, amen, say amen, amen, I don't know what you come to do, 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 my feet, my feet, my hand, my head, my, my, my mind. Say amen. Amen. I don't know what you come to do. 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 I come to say amen. 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 Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver these from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand to your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Mm. Only with your eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall thee, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I'll deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Now did God cover the service with the precious blood of Jesus. And give us your Holy Spirit that we may lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I'd like everyone to turn your hymnals to page number 248. Time is filled with swift transition. Oh, no. Change his hand. Hold to his hand. Hold on to God. God's unchanging hand. 
forsaken will still more closely to him cling. Well, we've got a hold to his hand. I'm talking about God's unchanging hand. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you for what you have available for us. Yes, Lord. Lord, we thank you for those, or pray for those who are not here. Yes, and Lord, we ask you to cover them. Lord, we ask you to touch their heart, yes. oh, Father God. And Lord, God, we rejoice in you. We just in awe at what you're doing and what you have done for us. Lord, we pray for shepherd of his house yes. and his family. Lord, may you continue to cover him, may you continue to protect him, dear Father God. 
but we are aware of the attacks of the devil on him, dear Father God. But Lord, we know that he will stand resolute in you. And oh God, may you give him as you always do, dear Father God, the true word. Lord, you put him here for your reason. Yes, hallelujah. And so, God, we pray for him and his family. Lord, we pray for the elders of this church, touch dear Father God. Touch them, touch them. Lord, they are so obedient to your calling. And oh, God, we ask you to just put an extra coverage on your lives, dear Father God. Strengthen them, dear Father God. Yes. For they are also human as us. And Father God, we pray for the members of this holy tabernacle, dear Father God. Yeah, yeah. Lord, may you continue to bless them. Yeah. May you continue to give them long gifts. Yes. And oh God, cover their family. As I said, dear Father God, blessed is the man who sees children, children. Yes. And so yes. God, we are happy for them. Lord, we pray for the children, dear Father God. You said, suffer the children to come unto me. And forbid them not. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless the parents and the grandparents who do the good deed of taking their children here to hear the good words, so Father God. And oh God, respective of the pain that we feel each day, yeah, respective of the financial oh, yeah. issues in our life, yeah. pending, even dear Father God, our loved one passing. Yeah. But God, that will not stop our praise. It will not stop our praise to you, dear Father God. Yeah. Yeah. Respective of what is happening around this world, dear Father God, the election. I know, God, the rumors, yes. but we believe in your words. Yes. That is, Hallelujah. irrespective of what the doctor's report say, yes. we believe only in your report. Yes. Healing. I know, God, we ask you to cover us this week, yes, Lord, with your blood. And remind us who you are yes. and where we are going. Yes. So we will not, we'll not divert, we will not digress. And we continue to bless your holy name. In no other name but the mighty and glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Jesus is the way maker. Jesus is the way maker. Jesus is the way maker. Oh, one day, one day he made a way for me. Jesus is the way maker. Jesus is the way. Jesus is a mind regulator. Jesus is a mind regulator. Jesus is a mind regulator. One day, one day, he made a way for me. Jesus is a heart fixer. Jesus is a heart fixer. He made a way. 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 He made a way.
way. He made a way. He is the way. He made a way. He is the truth. He made a way. He is the light. He made a way. He is the way. He made a way. He is my way. He made a way. Jesus is the way. He made a Jesus is the way. If you call on Jesus, he will answer prayer. prayer. Call on Jesus, oh, he, he will answer prayer. prayer. Call on Jesus, he will answer prayer. He will, he will answer prayer. I know he will. He will answer prayer. Call on Jesus. He will Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, that's what I want to work on in this part of our series where we've been dealing with making the Jesus case. In apologetic form, we've been looking at making the Jesus case, that is defending the faith about Jesus and making sure that our lives can give a testimony about the Lord Jesus Christ, what he says, who he is, and his promises. And so the question today is, can your life witness to who Jesus is? And do you have an account that's based on what it is that Jesus Christ has done? Because he's the one that can fill our accounts, and he's the one that can give us everything that we need in order to have things that are acceptable to God. And so somebody may say, well, I don't even know that I have an account or even opened up one. I'm familiar with my earthly one, but I don't know anything about a heavenly one. And then there are those who may not know how to go about the procedure of even opening up an earthly account, probably never done one before, probably never even had a mortgage at all. And so they don't know about the process and uh, they may not even know about the heavenly process. And so. What I want to look at in this message is our life account, what it is that we have. And so when you're talking about accounts, you're looking at a system of exchanges, expenditures, uh, things that are paid for, not paid for. And many people may look at that as their value and their worth as to how much they have in their account and how much they owe. And so when it comes down to our heavenly account, each and every single one of us has one. And so the question is, where is it? And what is it full of? What's it filled with? That determines our value. And so many people may have accounts in their bank, quite a bit of money, a lot of assets. They may have homes, mortgages, businesses, a lot of assets, but yet not have a really good heavenly account not be in good standing where heaven is concerned. It's very possible to be above water where the earth is concerned, but in the negative, way in the rears where heaven is concerned. And so the most important thing is to have a heavenly account. And that's the very thing that you and I have to show in order to give a witness and testify to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a level of understanding that we have to have about our value, who we are, what's most valuable, our assets where heaven is concerned, our assets where the world is concerned, how valuable that is, and just what's most important. And what will really give the right kind of testimony as to our true assets and value. So what I wanna look at in this part of our series that we're working on quite some time is building a heavenly account. How do I build a heavenly account? And just what is a heavenly account? You're talking about exchange, where your life is concerned, you're talking about expenses uh, that need to be paid, you're talking about possibly owing debts and all those banking terms and all those things that have to deal with finances. And so what does that have to do with my soul? Well, when it comes down to a life that's lived for God, there are things that's acceptable, not acceptable. There are things that are owed. There are things that have to be done. There's forgiveness involved, which is a banking term. It has to do with business. It has to do with profit and loss and all the things that the Bible lays out very clearly as far as stewardship is concerned. And so the question is, are we wise or are we foolish where our accounts are concerned? And the way you and I have to testify is to show a positive account, one that's filled with things that are acceptable to God because they're the only thing that's going to have eternal value. And so just what is the most valuable thing to you right now? Is it all the things that you have? What can you purchase? What things have you purchased? What do you plan on purchasing? What are you building? How is your home? How is it put together? How is it structured? How is it shaped? And then how important is that to God? How does it hold up as far as a testament to the Lord Jesus Christ? And don't get me wrong, when it comes down to blessings, certain assets can be very much blessings, can be the favor of God. And we ought to be thankful for our homes, our vehicles, uh, the food that we have, the clothes that we wear. If you've got a good bank account and things are going well and your bills are paid, praise God. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is this heavenly account that you and I have. In fact, you've heard it said that when judgment comes, you and I have to do what? Give an account for our stewardship. What it is that we've done what it is that we haven't done and just how we lived our lives for God. Amen. 
that's the most important thing. And so that's what I want to look at in this message is building this heavenly account. Just how do we get it? And how do we maintain it? How do we sustain it? You sustain your earthly account by doing what? You get paid. You may get direct deposit. You may make deposits yourself and you make sure your bills is paid so as your assets don't get taken. Your assets don't want to get stripped and uh, removed. And so what do you do? You make sure that your bills are paid for and secure by the money that you deposit. That's what keeps you safe. But when it comes down to your heavenly account, what is it that keeps you safe? And what deposits are really truly being made? And so there's not necessarily an institution that you go to that you make deposits in. And so therefore, there's got to be something spiritually that accounts for uh, the very things that we have that make for that which is going to be acceptable to God. And when you and I think about it, we're on the witness stand day in and day out. And there's also what seems to be almost like a collection agency that's constantly looking at your account. Seeing how short you are, how you don't measure up, and accusing you of not having enough, not being able to do enough, not valuable enough, not being able to do certain things. As a matter of fact, according to the world, many of us have no credit at all, have no credibility, can't do certain things, and don't do certain things. And if you examine your life close enough, if you're not careful, you'll be deceived into thinking that you don't have a good enough heavenly account. And that somehow you can't purchase certain things, you can't do certain things, and you just don't have enough. Well, I want to tell you as a basis, as a premise, before we go any further, that if you got Jesus, you've got more than enough. Amen. He fills your account. Amen. Imagine having nothing. Imagine being negative in the rear for eternity. Then somebody comes along and fills it. And in natural, you don't have enough to pay your bills. You don't know where your money's coming from. And all of a sudden, somebody comes along with a card and says, don't worry about a thing. I've got it all covered completely. Yeah. There's no debt. You don't owe. As a matter of fact, you don't owe anymore. Amen. No more bills a day in your life. What would you say? Amen. What if you're smart, you'd accept it? Well, accepting the Lord Jesus Christ in your life seals and pays the debt that you and I owe. Yeah. That you and I could have nothing to pay for with. As a matter of fact, we're redeemed about his blood. And so therefore he fills our heavenly account. So where salvation is concerned, our accounts are totally full. But what about this sanctification and maintaining and sustaining? Because if the truth be told, there are days when we feel low and we just can't go and we don't have enough. And so you may not want to give a defense for your life and for the gospel and for Jesus Christ because you feel so down. You feel so drained. As a matter of fact, you have Jesus, but you feel empty. And you don't feel sustained. And so you and I need to make sure that we're aware of our heavenly account. And if you don't have one, you're going to have to get one. First, you open it up at the cross, receiving the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You get salvation. You get justification. You get sustained. And it doesn't matter what you have built or don't have built, what you've got in your account or don't. You've got Jesus, and he's everything from there. Also, you'll find through the sanctification process that Jesus Christ fills every void in your life. He gives you every single thing that you need. And so anywhere that you're short, any place that uh, you think you can't purchase a certain thing, if it's within the will of God, God takes care of it. If it's something that God wants you to have, you'll have it. If it's something God doesn't want you to have, you won't have it. The bottom line is Jesus is the one that sustains you. And where these spiritual accounts are concerned, with the presence of the deposit of the Holy Spirit, you and I are sealed to the day of redemption. Yes. And we have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Yes. We have the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. He fills our hearts and our minds. He directs our vessels. He does everything that you and I need to be done. Yes. So with that, the victory is won. And everything that you and I need, both physically and spiritually, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the most important thing is this spiritual account, this heavenly account that we have, whereby you and I can have treasures in heaven, and you and I can get our rewards, and you and I can have our minds regulated by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when it comes down to giving a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I can say, look at my account. Yeah. Look at what I've got. I'm not short. Mm. I'm not in the rears. 
I'm not in a negative. Matter of fact, my account is full. I might be broke, but I'm full. I might not have everything physically, at least not at this present time, but I've got the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I've got my mind. I've got my focus. I've got the vision. I've got the promise. And so I know that even though certain things aren't deposited right now, I know he's going to do it because he said he's going to do it. I don't have it right now, but it's coming. I don't have it. At, listen, I've got access to it and I know that I can get it and he'll do it whenever he sees fit. He's keeping me right now. I'm not hungry or want for anything because Jesus Christ totally sustains me. The Holy Spirit keeps me. So what I've got is this heavenly account that's very important. So my faith is uh, maintained mm -hmm. through obedience is sustained. Yeah. And that's the very thing that I can use in my life to show forth the character and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my defense mm -hmm. and my defense is going to be to show forth my heavenly account. And with that, what I want to look at very briefly is this foundational truth that you and I have a divine imputation. And I let that word scare you. It's a theological term, but it has everything to do with the promise that you and I have of the exchanged life. That is, the life of righteousness that we have imputed upon us or deposited in us by God based on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. With that, the guilt and the shame and the punishment and penalty for sin and the judgment upon sin was placed or imputed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That exchange life took place at the cross. It is after, listen, it's applied to the life of he or she that believes. Yes. And so it's by faith that you and I get this divine imputation. That you and I get this direct deposit on the inside of our soul to sustain us and maintain us for an eternity. With that, you and I have a blessed building of a heavenly account. And so that's what I want to look at in this message. And I want to get back to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to get there in a moment. But first, I want you to take your Bible and I want you to go to Romans chapter 4. Because when we get to Hebrews, we're going to look at Abraham, who is considered to be the father of faith. And I'll explain that in a little while. But it's by his faith that he was maintained and that he was sustained and he was blessed. And that many nations and multitudes were blessed after him. And so you and I are a pattern after that very model of faith. And that's the reason why he qualifies to be on what is called the roll call of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. If you remember anything about Abraham, his name first was Abram, which meant exalted father. And uh, it was by his faith in the promises of God and his obedience toward God that he received the name Abraham because he believed what it is that God said he was going to do. Just as plain and simple as that. And so that's the utmost importance to God, that we believe who God is and we do what God says to do. That is the, the utmost importance and top priority. So nothing else is greater, nothing else is worthier, nothing else is a bigger name than to believe what it is that God says. Because that dictates every single area of your life. God makes a promise, God gives an instruction, you and I believe that promise, we carry out that instruction, that's the greatest degree of success that you'll ever have. Many people may accomplish a lot of things and do a lot of things, but be disobedient to God, they haven't accomplished a thing. But yet there are many people who don't have a big name, not well known, but yet they have faith in God, obedient to God, and where their heavenly account is concerned, they've got deposits of the grace of God and the blessings of God that can maintain and sustain for a lifetime. Yeah. Many people may not know a lot of people like this by name, but where heaven is concerned, they're very popular. Yeah. Why? Because they live their lives by faith and obedience in accordance to the will of God. Yeah. That's what makes a great name. So now where Abraham is concerned, uh, he got very popular. You'll ask many people who may be even non-believers, may not know a thing about the Bible. You mention Abraham, and uh, they'll be very familiar with him. But when you're talking about people who know God, people who love God and obedient to God, Abraham's name rings a mighty big bell because he's known for having faith in God. Yeah. He's known for being obedient to God, and that's the very way in which, now watch this, the very way in which he received a great divine heavenly account. So we're going to look at that in a moment in Hebrews chapter 11, but first look at Romans chapter 4, and what you're going to see is the apostle Paul given the very foundational truth that Abraham was justified by faith. Now, not just Abraham, but it has to be anybody that is going to have salvation uh, to be justified by faith. 
and not necessarily by the things that you do, but it's going to be by the faith that you have in God was going to dictate what it is that you do. So uh, the Bible says here that Abraham is justified by faith. That is his total dependence upon God. And so the reason why the Apostle Paul is writing this because he's looking at this church in Rome and uh, they could be up under a lot of persecution. And so he wants to make sure that they are reminded of their true name, their true identity and who they are in Christ and how they're justified and how their accounts ought to be really, truly full. And that's of the utmost importance because Rome was highly pagan, uh, had a lot to do with people worshiping idols and uh, a lot of focus on health and wealth and prosperity and all those things and people's lives were measured by their materialistic value. And so what the Apostle Paul wants to make sure they know and are reminded of is that listen, your value is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You're justified not by all the things that you do, not by your big accomplishments and your big name, but you're justified by your faith in Jesus Christ. And look at the model and be reminded of the model of Abraham. All the way back then, you're reminded of Abraham's what? His faith. Not his wealth. Not his prosperity. Not what he built. Not what he put together. And uh, not all the places necessarily that he went and the things that he did and his accomplishments. But had everything to do with what? His faith in God. His dependence upon God. His life commitment to God and his trust in God and his obedience to the instructions of God. So look at Romans chapter 4 and look what the Bible says. He says in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So not about his works, not about his accomplishments, but it's about his faith. That's how he's justified, or meaning made or declared righteous before God. Amen. Verse 3 says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So therefore, it wasn't about what he deposited, wasn't about what he did, but wasn't about what he put in, but it was about what God counted and credited to his life, Amen. based on his faith in him. Yeah. So God gave a promise. God gave an instruction by faith. Abraham carried it out. And that's how his account, what it says here, his account got full. That's how he was accounted righteous or in right standing with God. And so he didn't do a bunch of stuff to get in right standing with God. All he did was have faith in the promise of God and his obedience carried it out. So with that, the Bible says, listen, he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now what that tells me is that nothing else that he could do or anybody else could do for him could make his account full. As a matter of fact, it shows that it was a degree of emptiness before his belief. And so keep in mind this, when you and I are born, you should be very familiar with the scripture that makes it clear that we're born in sin and shape and iniquity. Yeah. So you and I are born with an empty account. As a matter of fact, we're born in the negative. Yeah with no, listen, with no potential in and of ourselves to fill it by ourselves at all. Yeah. And so therefore there needs to be a deposit. There needs to be something placed in our accounts. There's something we need to be charged with because we got this negative charge against us. Yeah. So we're born with all kinds of charges against us. Ooh. We're born empty, we're born in the negative. Yeah. Not able to pay for it ourselves. Yeah. And so therefore you and I need a deposit. You and I need an imputation. You and I need something that can fill our accounts that will be acceptable to God and make us right, listen, and right standing before him. Yeah. That's going to be our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. In Jesus being the Redeemer, in the blood of Jesus, and his finished work on the cross. So now, that belief is what gets us righteous. That belief is what gets our heavenly accounts full. And that's why he goes on in verse 4 to say, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And so that shows you, you can work and work and work and do and do and do and accomplish and all, do all kinds of things and still be in debt. Amen. There are people who do all kinds of accomplishments, but still in debt. Amen. There are people who have a lot of money, but still owe. Yeah. And so therefore, their belief system is weak. And so the things that they do is not counted where God is concerned as being worthy whatsoever. But he says, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. 
He says, but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And that goes against the grain of modern day banking. But where heaven's banking system is concerned, it has everything to do with being very valuable based on your belief system and based on your faith. He says, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. So it's not about your empty, vain religion, not about what you do mechanically or systematically. It has to do with belief in God. In our case now, in the age of grace, belief in what it is that Jesus Christ did on the cross. Belief that he took your sins on him one time and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And that God imputes righteousness, listen, to your life based on the finished work of Jesus Christ and based on your belief in him. Just as plain and simple as that. And so you and I with that faith, you and I with that belief are walking around with a full account. So therefore, it's not based on what it is that we do, but based on what it is that Jesus Christ has done. Yeah. That ought to affect every single decision that you make, every single path that you take, and how you feel about yourself, how you feel about Jesus, and how you deal with the devil. With that, that puts you on the witness stand as one who can say that, listen, I've got Jesus, I've got righteousness, I've got salvation based on what it is that he's done. So all these accusations that come against me and all this negativity that rises up against me and all these bad names and all these lies and all this stuff that happens, it's not worth anything because it imputed to Jesus was all of my sin, all of my unrighteousness, all my shame, all of my guilt, and charged to me was righteousness based on what he's done for me on the cross. And it has changed my life. It has changed my mind. I'm a brand new person and my account is totally full. Right now, I do not owe and I'm living my life with the riches of the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's something that will shine forth through your life. It's something that will give you a life of faith even further and obedience even more and will bring you joy that the world just doesn't have. And listen, set you in a position that even people with a lot of money and a lot of buildings just can't go. It'll put you in a place of peace, holiness, and righteousness that the world cannot and will not experience. He says, blessed are those, watch this, verse 7, blessed, that is totally satisfied, totally content, totally positioned, in the right position. He says, are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Now that word forgiven is another banking term which means releasing of a debt. It says, all your lawless deeds or all your acts of unrighteousness, past, present, and future, are what? Forgiven. Based on your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he removes all the guilt and the shame. He removes all the debt. And so you have to work to try to pay your debt or clear things up because by the blood of Jesus Christ, it's all done. It's all taken care of. And so he says, blessed, that means you're content. You're satisfied. Your mind is set forth in the right direction. You're stable. You're healed. You're made whole. You're delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, whose lawless deeds are forgiven. And so somebody who's righteous lives a forgiven life, a debt-free life in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, and whose sins are covered. How are they covered? With a sheet? With a blanket? With something that can get kicked off? No, they're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen, I've had things stained with blood, and that stain, I mean, it's there. It's in there. And anything that was over, listen, anything that was under it, I can't see it. Because that blood just covers it. So when you're talking about your life that was lived in sin, and all of your sins based on the blood of Jesus Christ, it's covered. And so when God looks at you, what does he see? He doesn't see that. He, listen, he sees the blood of Jesus. Which is enough, listen, enough to give you right standing before God. Amen. He goes on to say in verse 8, blessed is the man, or content or happy, truly is the man, to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Uh-huh. That means you're no longer guilty, all the charges are dropped, you no longer owe, yeah. the debt has been forgiven, so imputation or charging of sin is not imputed. Not to one who has, listen, who has been covered by the blood of Jesus and who has right standing based on what it is that Jesus Christ has truly done. So with that, take your Bible and go to Hebrews chapter 11. 
And the Apostle Paul made all that very clear because he wants them to know how they're to live in the Lord Jesus Christ. How we live in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. That's the most important thing. And it's the, re listen, the reason why he's driving that home and really stressing that, because like even right now, a lot of people get caught up in religion. And uh, there's a lot of times, and you probably had this, I've had it, and if you hear me, you will. Days and times when you think, you know what, I'm just, maybe am I, am I saved still? And all the things that I've done and all the things I'm thinking about, you know, I, need, I know that even to think something long enough and hard enough is a sin. Am I still saved? And maybe I ought to do a whole lot more. Is it something I'm not doing? And uh, all these things are happening, and I know I've been doing a lot of good things, and maybe they shouldn't be happening. God, maybe show me where my account is. I feel kind of low. Maybe there's something I owe. And so, God, have I just paid it? Are all my bills paid? Am I doing something wrong? Have I just done something bad? It seems like the devil's unloaded on me. God, you just stepped out of the way. So what is that I've done? Listen, it's not always something you've done. As a matter of fact, walking around in a blessed life attracts demonic attacks. Yes. So it could be very well the fact that you're full is the reason why the devil's chasing after you, trying to drain you. Because he knows that all the stuff that you've got is enough, really, to deal with all the things that he's trying to do. And he want to make sure he drains you so you don't know who you are in Christ. And so a lot of things that people do a lot of time is to think that somehow I ought to be doing something. I ought to be doing something more. Listen, not always about what you do. It's about who you believe in, about who you trust. Maybe you need to trust, trust God more. Maybe the reason why you feel like you feel is because your faith has kind of gone down a bit. Listen, maybe you're looking at too many other things and maybe you're loading up with too much other stuff and it's weakening your faith. Or maybe you're looking too much at the problem and not enough at God. Amen. Maybe you're looking at too much of what the devil is doing and got your eyes off the promises of God. Amen. So maybe you need to get your focus right. That's something you did bad. You need to get your focus straight on what it is that God is doing and make sure that you're reminded that the kingdom of God is first. Maybe you're just too anxious about where certain things are going to come from. Listen, too many times people spend too much time focused on bills, yeah. on things that you owe. Just, God, what am I going to do? Well, what have you done up to this point? Right. How have you been fed and sustained and kept up to this point? Yeah. How have you had a roof up to now? Yeah. You think God is just going to stop and quit just because you got a problem right here, right now? Yeah. And listen, too many times people made the problem too big and made God very small. Yeah. And so you need to look at what it is that God has promised and his sustaining power and his keeping power. And listen, the one that made you righteous based on the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. is the one that can take care of your little problem that you got right here and right now. So a lot of times the issues become bigger than who God is. And you need to step back and just look at what it is that God is doing in your life and what it is that God has done. Take an inventory and literally, you've heard this a thousand times, but listen, we need to be reminded, literally count your blessings. Right. When was the last time you just gave Listen, when was the last time you just got intimately In the presence of God and counted your blessings yeah. And just look at what God has done Yeah, you got certain things you anticipated Certain things you want, but you just step back And you look at what God has done in your life yeah. I mean, just think back at the last 30, 40, 50 years And just look at what it is that God has done yeah. Just last week, look at where he brought you from Look at what you used to be and what you are now and what you came out of and how God delivered you and how God sustained you and set you free. Just take an inventory of what it is that God has done. I mean, really look at your account and where it is right now. I don't mean looking at what you got on your account as far as your bills and what you owe and how much money you've got and how full your cabinets are and all that kind of stuff. Look at your heavenly account and what it is that God has truly done. Yeah. And the fact that you know you didn't put checks inside of your heavenly account. Yeah. That God made those deposits. Number one, God saved you. Number two, God sustained you. He's the one that kept you when you didn't have enough. I mean, when your mind was empty, you couldn't even think. You didn't know which way to turn. God deposited a fresh revival of the Holy Ghost in your life and charged you right back up again. God built you up. God sustains you. God made you happy. You had no joy. You had no peace. And you wonder where that peace came from. You wonder where that joy came from. And you can't explain it. You can't describe it. But all you know is that God did it. And kept you from losing your mind. Kept you from killing yourself. Kept you from killing somebody else. And he gave you a brand new fresh charge. And it came from heaven. You didn't plug it into a wall. You didn't plug it into a person. You plug it right into heaven. And God gave you a fresh surge of the Holy Ghost. And it was enough to keep you even further. 
That was your heavenly account where God sustained you. And he gave you the peace that surpasses all understanding. And he kept you. And you know what? He's keeping you right here and right now. Even with all the stuff you got on your mind, even through all of that, somehow you see your heavenly account above everything else. Look, this is what I don't have, but this is what I got. I don't have all these things. I don't have all these people. I don't have all these situations. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I got God who is everywhere. And even if he don't take me right now, he's capable of getting me there. Because look where he brought me from. I know he can take me a whole lot further. I don't care what's not working. I don't care what's not moving. I don't care what's not rolling. I don't care what's dysfunctioning. It makes no difference because I know that God can fix it. And even if he ain't fixed it right now, I know he's going to fix it. Because he told me he's going to fix it. And he got me right now and he saved me and I'm alive based on his grace. And I know he's going to do what he said he's going to do. That's the faith that keeps you and sustains you. That's the faith that overrides the doctors when they say that you don't have enough insurance or you don't have enough of this, that, and the other. God, listen, God will sustain you by faith. And you know what it is that God said he would do? And when you know how God's going to bring about divine healing, you trust in him. And he's the one that's going to keep you. He's the one that's going to fill you. He's the one that's going to sustain you. It'll blow the doctor's lives. And it'll fill up their accounts with more money than they got. They might have faith to come to Jesus after they see your healing. And they see how God deals with you. That's the faith. The faith that you and I live by. All you have to do is obedient and how you be sustained. And that's what you'll get on the witness stand with. Just like Abraham. So the Bible makes it very clear in chapter 11. He says in verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. Now if you remember back in Genesis chapter 12, uh, this wasn't no easy call. This wasn't just some simple bus trip that he paid for and went shopping somewhere. Listen, he was called out of everything that was familiar. Yes. Out of his father's house, this pagan nation, and go to a place that he didn't know where in the world he was going. Yes. Away from everything that was totally familiar. Now, back in that time, family was very important. Yes. It would be considered a sin to get miles away from your family. Yes, and so for him to go out from his family, from his father's house where he was familiar, was something that had to be a miracle. Yes. And something that took faith and obedience in God. Yes. And so Abraham did what? By faith, he obeyed God. Yes. Bible says when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. Uh -huh. And so he believed what it is that God said, what it is that God said he would do. Uh, obviously there was something he was short of where he was and something he was going to get where he was going but in the middle of that he had to do what? Obey God. Yes. Have his steps ordered by God and go do what it is that God said to get something that he didn't have right now. And I believe this, I just believe that God's got far greater for me than the devil wants me to settle for. And far greater than I could get from a certain position uh, beyond God, what God would take me to. And so if God says go somewhere, I've got to get there based on obedience. Because I know that God knows what's over there is better than what's right here. God knows something. And you know what God doesn't have to do? Listen, God didn't have to explain everything to me in detail before I do it. There was a time when I had to, listen, I wanted God to lay everything out. Completely. But now it's gotten to the point where God tells me to do something. Listen, I trust God enough where I just go. Because I know that God knows it. Listen, God knows what he's doing. There's enough that God has already done where I can clearly trust that God just knows what he's doing. He knows the end from the beginning. So God, I may not understand it. I can't figure it out, but I'm just going to trust you. A lot of times, of course, God's will and God's instructions and God's guidance goes totally against the grain of the way that we normally would think and the way that common sense would even think a lot of times. Certainly putting us in an uncomfortable place often or inconvenient place and an unfamiliar place, but yet it'll be the place of blessing. And so it was a place where Abraham would receive favor and uh, where he would receive an inheritance. The Bible says, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Yeah. It says, by faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him, watch this, the heirs of him of the same promise, for he waited for the city, watch this, which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. He waited. Listen, he had a vision beyond where he was. Amen. Sure, the house he was in was very comfortable. 
and what he had was very comfortable. And uh, he wasn't necessarily going to something where he'd have a big mortgage and a whole lot of land and that'd be it. Listen, he was looking beyond that. In fact, you can say that he was looking prophetically. The Bible says here that he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Amen. So it wasn't all about what he was going to do. It wasn't all about all the equity that was going to be in it. He wasn't necessarily looking for a physical gold mine. It wasn't about all he was going to build to it and upgrade it and make it appreciate and do all these kind of things like that. Listen, he had spiritual blessings, top priority over physical blessings. Amen. Listen, his focus and his mindset was on the kingdom more so than the things of this world. Amen. And so anytime you and I have our steps ordered by God, listen, our focus and our top priority have to be spiritual blessings. Amen. Has to be even being a blessing. So everything that God's going to do in our lives is going to be something that's going to cause the Holy Spirit to operate through us. So it's not limited to what it is that's done with our hands or what we put together or what we sustained or how much it's going to make or how much equity it's going to build or whatever the case may be or whether we're going to get rich off of it or whatever the situation is. It's always going to be about the blessing that God is going to do through it yeah. and the thing that God's going to do with us through it, top priority, yeah. first and foremost. And so in closing, I'm going to have to stop it right there and pick up with the Lord willing next week. But I want to say a couple of things, just maybe about two or three things about Abraham and then we'll be ready to go from there. Listen, the reason why uh, the Apostle Paul has Abraham here is because he's considered the father of faith. Now, remember, Jesus said no man is considered to be our father. There's only one father. That's God. But when it talks about the father of faith, it has everything to do with the translation of the pattern and structure of what it is that he did obediently to God. So it has to do with his actions. It has to do with what it is he did. And so with the model after what it is that Abraham did. What did he do? He lived his life by faith. And so there are certain things that you and I need to know about Abraham. It's not many, but number one, we need to know about Abraham. And the reason why he's called to be on this witness stand is because he lived his life in obedience toward God. He was obedient to God. God said, get thee out of thy father's house into a land where I will show you. What did he do? He did it. He obeyed God. That is, he carried out God's instruction. That means he had a mindset to be obedient. So that's the first thing that we uh, should take after Abraham, is that he had a mindset to be obedient. Amen. You and I ought to have a mindset to be obedient. That means a willingness to be obedient. Not all this grumpy stuff where it's a thing uh, where we sit back and, what is God going to tell me to do today? Yeah. You know, I did enough stuff yesterday. What is God going to come up with? Now, not that kind of attitude. But listen, you and I ought to have a, a willingness to be obedient to God. We ought to be thinking about what it is that God is going to tell me to do next. We ought not be able to wait for God to give us an instruction. Because we know the blessing that's going to come about. I know that God knows what he wants to do with my life. Listen, you ought to be, you ought to be thankful to be counted worthy to take an instruction from God and carry it out. Amen. That your vessel is a, listen, a chosen vessel to be used by God. Yes. People may say, well, well, why me? Why not him or her or the other? And things like that. Well, you've been chosen by God. And God has given you an instruction. So you ought to be grateful to be able to be obedient to God. Now, I'll tell you what you don't want. You don't want a situation where you can't hear from God. Come on now. Be careful when you're not hearing anything. God is talking, but you can't hear it. Chances are the volume's turned up on a whole lot of other stuff. Or you've got people who are just flat out reprobate. They just can't, their conscience is seared where God is concerned. So you better be glad that you're hearing from God. Amen. And don't be disobedient long enough you get a hard heart, but be glad that you hear from God. Amen. And so a mindset to be obedient. That is a willingness oh, yeah. to be obedient. What did Abraham have? He had a willingness to be obedient to God. Amen. Whatever it is that God said, he did it. Now, Abraham, can't tell the whole story today, we just don't have time. Of course, being human, he got off track yes. at times with certain things. that He tried to figure it out and do things his own way, but very... Uh, quickly he saw well that wasn't the right way Amen. Abraham got off track but he got right back on track yes. but he still had a mindset and a willingness to be obedient Amen. he carried that with him so that's what you and I ought to have and that's what uh, we ought to uh, pattern after the second thing is that Abraham was a man of faith mm -hmm. now that may sound small but it's a very big thing because it's right here in Hebrews chapter 11 as a matter of fact it's all throughout the Bible and uh we just read not too long ago, before, right in this same book, where without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen. Listen, you and I can't please God without faith. And so Abraham was a man of faith. And so the question is, are you a man or woman of faith? Amen. You might have a lot of substance. 
You might have a lot of things, but do you have faith? Yes. Well, somebody might say, well, yeah, I got plenty of faith. Well, here's a test going to come. And just like Abraham, the test may come as to how much faith you actually have in God. Well, you might trust God to get it, but can you trust God to keep it? Amen. What if God says, now give it back? Well, God says, do this, that, and the other with it. Well, the question is, are you a man or woman of faith? Can you trust God in any situation with any particular thing? And so uh, can you maintain that faith in God, continually have faith in God? And so when you're talking about being a man or woman of faith, that means your lifestyle is in faith toward God. I uh, live my life continually submitted to God. I'm completely sold out for the Lord. And so if God has a word, God has a promise, God says to do a certain thing, I'm trusting in God. I'm taking my whole being, body, soul, and spirit, and I'm laying it on God. Amen. Even when temptation comes to go in other directions, I'm going to lay right here with God. I'm going to stick to my guns, and I'm going to stay right with God. Uh, other people may tell me to do other things, but I've got faith in God. Um, certain things may come to my mind. The devil may give me other directions, but I'm totally having faith in God. And so you're absolutely committed to God. That's the second thing. And thirdly, Abraham was an intercessor. He stood in the gap. He was one who stood in the gap between God and where man was concerned. Now, ultimately, Jesus Christ is our mediator. Jesus Christ is the one who uh, prays and intercedes before us, before God. But as a mighty good model, we've got Abraham, who was used as a choice vessel of God to do the things that was totally needed. And uh, with that, his identity went from exalted father, because he was obedient to God, into Abraham being the father of many nations, father of different, uh, many multitudes. So God used him to bring forth quite a bit of blessing to quite a bit of people, not just Jew, but Gentile as well, and even extended there. So what you have is Abraham being on the witness stand as a faithful, obedient man who had his life totally sold out to the Lord. And he believed God. Listen, he took God at his word. Amen. God gave a word. God gave a promise. And he carried it out. And you notice where it affected Isaac and Jacob. So they partook of the same kind of promise. Not perfect people, but they lived their lives by faith in God totally committed to the will of God. And the Bible makes it clear, i got to reiterate this, is that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Yes. Plain and simple, how he got his account full was that he just believed God. So the question today is, where is your account? Amen. Not your physical account, whatever bank that you're in, it really makes yeah. no difference where God is concerned. Yeah. How much faith do you have in God? How much faith have you had in God? How much faith do you desire to have where God is concerned? Can you truly say that this is what God said, this is what needs to be done? Is your life an example of what it is that God will do? With that, you and I can have a heavenly account that's worth more than anything that this world has to offer. Amen. Amen. Amen.
that you're a sinner and that you need grace and your sins to be forgiven and you don't have enough to do it yourself acknowledge that and then the fact that Jesus Christ is the one that can forgive you of your sins and that he took care of it on the cross you're going to have to believe that that's the way you're going to receive salvation it's not complicated it's very simple Jesus died on the cross he came to this earth he's God in the flesh he did what needed to be done. He's the ultimate sacrifice. Oh, yes. And his blood justifies and declares the sinner right Thank before you. God. Thank you, Lord. And it's going to be your belief that makes that be able to apply to your life. It is what it is. It's the truth. But the only way it's going to be made valuable to you is if you believe it and receive it into your life. So you're going to have to repent. That means change your mind. You have to turn from sin and turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I can't do it my way no more. And I believe what you've done for me on the cross. There's nothing else that loves me more. I need you in my, in my life now. Come into my heart, forgive my sin, and give me eternal life. That's what you're going to have to do. That's the only way. And don't think that you're going to get down to a sick bed where that happens. You're not guaranteed a sick bed. Many people have sick beds. And they've accepted Jesus Christ at 1159 before they breathe their last breath. That's not guaranteed to everybody. It is by the grace and mercy of God that they experience that. It would only be by the grace and mercy of God that you would experience that. But don't take that gamble. Do not take that risk. Well, I'm just going to live it up and I'm going to try to figure out everything and understand and then I'm going to, you're not guaranteed that. It is very lofty and very arrogant for you to think that you can get through this day, any day without Jesus. Amen. You're here today Amen. because the breath that's in your life was created by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. You're here by the grace of God, by the mercy of God. You didn't wake yourself up this morning. God allowed you to get up this morning. He didn't necessarily have to allow you to lay back down where you got up from. And so you need to make a decision right here and right now. There are many people who woke up this week at some point. They were expecting to go back to bed. Never made it back home. People didn't make it off the job. Didn't make it off the highway. They were just going to pump gas and lost their life. Come on, Pastor. They had every intention yeah. on doing good things. Yeah. But you know what they did? They left Jesus out of the equation. Mm. So you need to get to know Jesus today if you're going to have eternal life. Accept him into your life right now. Open up your heart and let him in. He'll come in. If you repent, change your mind, turn from sin, he'll come in. If you're here right now today and uh, you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior, you want to know more about the blood of Jesus, you want to know more about the cross, you say, well, I want to hear more about the cross. I want to hear more about Jesus. And uh, I want to talk about some things. Well, I want to talk to you. 
like to set up a time when I can talk to you, hear what's on your mind. And uh, I want to see your soul get saved. I want to see you get baptized and be in the kingdom of God and have eternal life. I want to make sure that your soul is covered. You may be covered with material things, but listen, I want to make sure your soul is right before God. So if you're here today and you're not sure about whether or not your soul is right before God, come to me after service when you get a chance and we'll set up a time to talk about some things. We even talk to some things briefly right here and right now. I just want to make sure you're saved. Or wherever you're watching from, you might not be here to be able to come and talk, but I believe you've got enough information to make a decision, a conscious decision where your soul is concerned. Don't gamble with your soul. You've heard enough. Listen, you've heard the good news that Jesus Christ can deliver you from a burning hell and eternal damnation and destruction based on what he did on the cross. And he know what? He did it for you. You got to accept it for it to be applied, though. Wherever you're watching from, if you're watching this today, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Repent. Ask the Lord to come into your life, forgive you of your sins. Get our number. It's on the website. And uh, you can ask for me and uh, make a request. Set up a time and talk to you even further. Amen? Amen. Or maybe you've drifted away. You've gotten away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been in fellowship. You know him. But you've just gotten away in fellowship. You've done things your own way. You've gone miles and miles away from fellowship. Come on back again. Yes. Do the work like it needs to be done again. Boy. Don't waste time. You want to be a wise and faithful steward over the time that God blesses you with. So admit that you've gone astray and that you want to come back to fellowship with God and make things right this time. And know what he'll do? He'll pick up all the broken pieces yes, and do. put everything back together again yes, for you. Start you right from where you left off. He's there with open arms, ready to receive you. Amen? Amen. All right. If any one of those is you, uh, again, if you're here, like to talk to you after service, don't spend too much time thinking about it. Make your time now where you can uh, have a discussion. Um, or wherever you're watching from, make it up in your mind. But I want to pray for you right now. God, I just want to come in Jesus' name and just thank you for the time that we have today. Lord, just thank you for salvation. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the cross. I'm just asking, Lord, that you would do whatever it takes to drive anybody that doesn't know you to the end of their self, that they may cry out to you and receive you as Lord and personal Savior. Thank you, dear Father, for this fellowship, and I thank you, Father, for those that you want to bring into your glorious kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's look to the Lord, receive the benediction, and be dismissed. We're going to have a couple announcements, and then we're ready to go from there. And now may the God of all comfort and grace Establish your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore, until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.